we uh, get rolling. <coughs> Thank you for joining us, Luke. Uh, so I am, I was remiss in scheduling this walkthrough today. Since we've already started talking as a committee about uh, some of the fossil fuel uh, infrastructure bills, for some reason I had thought that Global Warming Solutions was a bill that we had, uh, we had walked through. And we haven't. And um, so, Luke, I appreciate you joining us today. Walk us through this. And, uh, take us through in some details. So thank gotcha. you. Well, thank you. Uh, for the record, Luca Marland, the Director of Legislative Council and Chief Counsel to the General Assembly. Good afternoon, everyone. You've already heard a lot of quality testimony about this bill. You heard from the sponsors, who I thought did a very good job of giving an overview of the bill. You heard from the Conservation Law Foundation that walked through some of the issues and their perspective, and you heard the law professor. And I wasn't here for all of that testimony, but I was here for much of it, and I looked at their handouts. And as a result, I intend to focus on other issues. For example, I do not intend to go through the Massachusetts law or litigation in depth. If you have questions, I can answer them, but I was going to instead focus on a walkthrough of the bill and then discuss some issues, legal and otherwise, that the bill may raise. Yeah. Uh, before I get started, two things I'd like to emphasize. First of all, please ask questions. Uh, you had some vigorous questions last time I was here, and that's fine. Uh, I welcome those. So don't hesitate to ask questions, and uh, don't hesitate to uh, you know follow up if you don't think my answer is sufficient. The other thing I want to emphasize is our nonpartisan nature. So when we walk through a bill that raises substantial issues, that's a substantive piece of legislation like this bill is, we are obligated to give you a background on legal issues and perhaps point out other things that you should consider if you wish to. But we're nonpartisan, and we don't care if you take this bill up, if you pass it without any changes, if you change every single word in it, or if you do something in between. And when I say we don't care, it means we care deeply. I care deeply about doing the best job I can, but I don't care about your decisions or your results because I'm nonpartisan. So, Without further ado, I'd like to begin with a walkthrough of the substance of the bill. Any questions before I start? This is H-462, and it is modeled on a bill that was introduced in Rhode Island. Section 1 contains legislative findings about the impact of climate change and the importance of this issue. I don't intend to read through them, but are there any questions about those findings? And as you know, legislative findings are often put in session law and not reduced to codified law because they give the legislature's perspective, but they don't, uh, they don't, they're not telling a party to do a certain action. So they're therefore put in session law. Section two is short title, the Vermont Global Warming Solution Act. And section three is really uh, where the important or substantive part of this bill begins. So currently in Title 10, Section 478, there's goals that Vermont has committed to to reduce greenhouse gas. What Section 3 does is make those goals mandatory instead of aspirational. So if this bill were to become law, it would state that green, it would be titled greenhouse gas reduction, and it would state that the state shall, in other words, a mandate, reduce emissions of greenhouse gases from within the geographical boundaries of the state, and those emissions outside the boundaries of the state that are caused by the use of energy in Vermont from the 1990 baseline by 25% by 2025, 50% by January 1st, 2035, and 75% by January 1st, 2050. And Sandra Levine pointed out when she testified, you'll see this later on in the bill when we go through what the obligations of A&R um, are to do under the bill, that there's also the 2045 date. So if you proceed with this bill to conform this section with the latter sections, you should also probably insert a benchmark for 2045, which is not there currently. And I'll explain that when we get to it. Any questions about what I've gone through so far? Going down to E, this is new language because it's underlined, and this is now really getting into the meat of the requirements. 
for a and r and the other state agencies that would be um, implicated by this bill i want to read e in its totality and explain it and then go through the other sections not later than one year after the effective date of this act the secretary of the agency of natural resources in consultation with the commissioner of the department of public service and the secretary of the agency of transportation shall adopt and implement rules to achieve the 2025 greenhouse gas reduction requirement established pursuant to and there's a cross site to the goals that we just went through so that is the requirement and you'll see there's similar requirements for each benchmark by year f sets forth what a and r and the other agencies will consider in developing these rules and f states that in developing and implementing the rules required above they will eval evaluate certain things, including the potential costs and economic and non-economic benefits of various reduction measures. To take into account the relative contribution of each source or category of sources to statewide greenhouse gas emissions. Three, conduct public hearings on the proposed rules. And I want to go through uh, the rule adoption procedure later in the role of LCAR, you'll see that this is also required under current law for the adoption of any rules. But these hearings would, yes? Excuse me, I'm sure. sorry. Uh, I'm just gonna make, oh, I missed a page. Did, are you, I my question. gotcha. Sorry. In these hearings, the secretary shall conduct a portion of the hearings in communities that have the most significant exposure to air pollutants. Number four, consider and address any reduction in greenhouse gas emissions within Vermont that may be offset by an increase in emissions outside Vermont. So these are some of the criteria factors that should be taken into account in developing the rules. Mr. Chair, do you want me to call on the- Yes, please, I'm sorry. Yes. So uh, <clears throat> since uh, I think in, before one, uh, in E, uh, it talks about uh, both electricity, well, electricity, transportation, and building sectors, right? Yep. Um, electricity is under the purview of the Department of Public Service, the yes. Public Utility Commission. Does this present a problem for a and R? I will get to that in a moment. It's a really good question. It's one of the issues I'll talk about. Okay. So if you can just bear with me for a few, we will discuss that. Any other questions before I move on to G? G states in developing the rules required by the subsection C, <coughs> the secretary may, so this is optional, not required, utilize such market-based compliance mechanisms that are reasonably necessary, convenient, or desirable for achieving the goals. <coughs> Consult with other state agencies and departments and other stakeholders. <coughs> And under H, every two years, the Secretary of Natural Resources will assess whether the rules are achieving their goals. And if they are not, adjust accordingly. So this is a structure. There is the mandate to adopt the rules to achieve the benchmark in a certain year, in this case, 2025. The factors the Secretary is supposed to look at and consider in developing those rules steps they can take, for example, they could consider a market-based approach, consult with other agencies, and then reassess every two years to see if it's working. And you'll see this structure repeats for each other subsequent benchmark. In subsection I and J, a similar pattern is now repeated for the next yearly benchmark, which is 2035. So this states on or before July 31st, 2024, the Secretary of Natural Resources shall adopt and implement rules to achieve the 2035 greenhouse gas <coughs> reduction requirement established and cites back to subsection A. And in all respects shall observe the requirements that we just went through in F and G about the factors to consider and the process to undertake. And then in J, the Secretary shall, no less frequently than once every two years, review and update the, regular, the rules as required to make sure they're meeting the benchmark. So once again, it's a repeat of the same approach. Yes? It's the 20, okay. Oh, no. Again, Okay. Question. 
K repeats the same approach. Now we're talking about the 2045 goals, but as I indicated earlier in that very first section, uh, we did not include a specific numerical goal for 2045, excuse me, 2045. So if you perceive it as a bill, you have to insert that uh, target for 2045. Is that clear? So K and L repeat the same structure. On or before July 31st, 2034, the Secretary shall adopt and implement rules to achieve the 2045 greenhouse gas reduction goals. And in all respects, follow the same criteria and process that was set forth above. And then in L, just as with the other sections, no less frequently than once every two years, review and update the rules as required to meet those benchmarks. And then finally, M and N repeat the same language and the same approach for the 2050 goals. <clears throat> yes? Okay, so I can foresee some uh, circumstances where, in, a, in trying to adjust the rules based on the, the uh, measured results, um, that it may require legislative action. You're asking really good questions. I'm going to ask you to bear with me again oh, okay. until we get to it. <laughs> so, uh, any other questions that I can answer at this time? <laughs> <laughs> so that's really the meat of this bill. Uh, section 4 is abrogation. And what this basically says that is if Vermont enters into a binding agreement with five or more states or Canadian provinces that achieve the same benchmarks that this, these requirements will not go into effect. Or under B, if there is a federal, uh, federal legislation or federal program that in some way achieves the same benchmarks, these requirements will not go into effect. So in other words, if the feds are doing it, the state law wouldn't go into effect. If Vermont enters a uh, agreement with other states or Canadian provinces that would meet the same benchmarks, this law would not need to go into effect. Is that clear? Uh, no, my Wi-Fi is not working. What is abrogation? Stop and no Thank longer you. in effect. Very great. It means, yeah, so if Vermont entered into a binding agreement with five other states and Canadian provinces this, this year, before anything happens, none of this would go into effect. If they do it before 2045, you've already implemented and taken steps, but you enter into such an agreement before 2045, basically this law would stop being in effect. Okay. So it could be before anything started, it could be halfway through. Okay. Now, C is just if such an occurrence happens that the governor would, in essence, certify that the multi-state or multi-province agreement or the federal program would be achieving the same benchmarks. Section 5 is enforcement. This was a section that raised some questions when previous witnesses testified about this. And let me uh, read through most of it for you. This would add a new law in Title 10. Under A, the Attorney General may investigate violations of Section 578, that's basically all the text that we went through, of this title. If the Attorney General finds that a person has violated or is violating this law, the Attorney General may bring an action in the Civil Division of Washington County or in the Civil Division of Superior Court of any Vermont County where venue lies. So the AG has authority to investigate uh, violations of this law and bring actions in civil, not criminal, civil court. Now, person, you say that they can, you'll notice that under line 13, says if the AG finds that a person has violated or is violating this law, and a person is defined in 10 VSA 552, which is the same chapter as any individual, corporation, legal entity, agency, or instrumentality of the state. So it's a broad definition of person. So that means the AG could investigate or bring action against an individual, legal entity, corporation, company, instrumentality of the state, municipality, et cetera. 
When you say of the state, does that mean resides in the state or of the state as in being part of the state apparatus? It means someone who's um, in the state violating the okay, law. Yeah, the it does mean an agency or department of the state of Vermont. It means a town, a municipality, a village, Anybody school district. It's pretty, person is pretty broad. Yeah. So it's a pretty broad term, and that's throughout Vermont law. But it is separately defined in this title also. In B, any person, same definition would apply, aggrieved by a violation of this law may bring an action in the civil division of the same court or in any civil division of an appropriate venue in the state of Vermont. Um, so this then gives a right of private enforcement um, as any person. Once again, the same definition applies. So it's an individual, it's an organization, it's a corporation, it's a company, could bring action uh, against someone who's violating this law. Under C, it sets forth what they could obtain. They could seek damages, injunctive relief, punitive damages in the case of willful violation and reasonable costs and attorney fees. Um, there was a suggestion from one witness to <coughs> modify this language a little bit, but as it's currently written, they could seek damages, which would be monetary damages, injunctive relief, which would be an order of the court similar to what happened in Massachusetts to do something, or for that matter, to stop doing something, or and or reasonable costs and attorney's fees. Did you have a question? Is it, and uh, any person uh, that right of private action was yes. part of the Mass, um, Massachusetts Well, I law. believe in Massachusetts, uh, CLF brought the suit or was involved in the suit. Yeah. I don't know who else was involved, okay. so I, I don't know. Any questions about that? Yes. If, if, if you're not the right person to answer for reasons sure. that I then just say sure. so. Uh, but I'm, I'm just, in terms of this uh, definition of person, it, it, if I'm reading it right, earlier in, in the bill, it's saying that uh, basically this is a, a responsibility of the state to, to see that we meet, meet these, yes. um, uh, that these, these not, that we actually meet the goals. So um, I'm just trying to imagine how a, um, an individual or a, 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 a company would be in, in violation of, of that. It's, it's a good question. So if this bill becomes law and ANR is obligated to develop these rules to meet the benchmarks, I assume those rules uh, might prohibit certain conduct. Uh, might uh, incentivize certain actions. I don't know, but okay. it, it could prohibit certain conduct or require perhaps that somebody um, has some approval to do something. And then if that person, individual company is violating that requirement, I could see that you might bring suit against that uh, okay. company or individual. Okay, because I, so, I, I was just more thinking, well, if we say, uh, this is just an example, we're going to reduce our uh, heating fossil fuel usage, mm -hmm. and I don't at my house. Um, uh, that would not be uh, that, would, that wouldn't because that's an it, overall requirement. Well, or, this is what I want to get to is uh, I want the a request that the committee start thinking about how this would play out on the regulatory level. So I don't know what the rules would require. Okay. They might require individuals to engage in certain activities or not engage in certain activities. And then maybe, maybe, I, I it might be violated. Okay. Any other questions before I proceed? Section 6 is a reporting requirement, and what it basically says is that the Secretary of ANR will uh, report to the General Assembly <coughs> on or before January 15th of every second year, beginning of each biennium, on the progress made during the past two years towards achieving these benchmarks and include the information set forth in one, two, and three. So it's a reporting requirement back to you, the legislature, about progress being made or issues being fixed. The next two sections concern GAC, Government Accountability Committee, and that process. And I'm going to flip through. I. When I drafted this, I kept in all this language about uh, the Government Accountability Committee, most of which is not changed because it's not a law that most people are familiar with. 
the new language is all the way here on the pot, top of page 12. And what this basically does is require that the Government Accountability Committee consider progress in meeting the greenhouse gas reduction goals in, uh, in their efforts to look at regulation and state programs. And then the Chief Performance Officer, which is an executive branch individual, um, when he or she is looking at this data, they're also supposed to consider whether state efforts and programs are meeting the greenhouse gas reduction goals. Yes? Doesn't this committee just, isn't there already, so, there already government accountability? Yes, yeah, so what I said is this is existing law. Yeah. It's adding a new factor oh, for them to weigh and consider and be aware of. I put all the existing law in the bill because it's not a section of law that most people are familiar with. So let's give it back. And then last but not least, we have the effective date, which will be July 1st of 2019. Now, this is a relatively short bill, uh, 13 pages, but it's quite a substantive bill, and it raises some issues that the committee should be aware of. And I want to talk about them now. The first would be the role of rulemaking in Vermont and the role of the legislature in oversight over rulemaking process. I want to talk about some constitutional and legal issues, and then I want to talk about some potential implementation issues which raises some of the points you raised about how does this intersect with existing Vermont law that also is relevant to greenhouse gas reduction. So let's talk about the LCAR process and rulemaking process. And some of you are familiar with this, but some of you are not. Please uh, interrupt me if there's any questions and I'm going too fast or too high a level. So first of all, rules have the force of law. Under 3 VSA 845, they're binding and they have the force of law. So if an agency promulgates a rule, it has the same authority as a statute that you may pass. Under 3 VSA 845 subsection C, it states that no agency may use the rulemaking authority to, one, provide for penalties, fines, or imprisonment not authorized by other law. In other words, they cannot impose a sanction of imprisonment or fine unless it's otherwise authorized in law. To enlarge the authority of any agency to impose requirements on any member of the public. Three, allow an agency by rule to require permits or licenses or fees unless authorized by other law. So any agency that requires a permitting process or a fee to get that permit, it has to be other, that authority has to be otherwise authorized in law, for example, in statute. Now, the procedure for adoption rules, I won't go through it in depth, but it has multiple steps. The agency or department would develop the proposed rule. In many cases, they would pre-file it with the executive branch committee on administrative rules, the interagency committee on administrative rules. They then file the proposed rule with the Secretary of State, um, and that filing includes various information, including an analysis of the economic impact and environmental impact of any proposed rule. I can go into those requirements in more depth if you want. The rules then published online with the Secretary of State, and there's a lot of information that's required in that packet or that publishing. They're required to hold public hearings, and then it's submitted to the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules, LCAR. And at that point, it's called a final proposal. I'm going to talk about the LCAR process in a moment, but once that process is concluded, it is finally filed and it becomes effective. So there's multiple stages, but you are only involved towards the end. Now, what is the role of LCAR? In other words, if this bill becomes law, and ANR is tasked with developing rules and implementing rules to achieve these benchmarks, <coughs> what is the legislature's role? The legislature through LCAR can only object to a potential rule on seven grounds. And they include, for example, that it was beyond the authority of the agency, it was contrary to the intent of the legislature, it is arbitrary, which is a defined term, and LCAR can then object and recommend that the rule be modified to meet its objections. The agency is required to respond to the objection 
and it, quote, may revise the rule. In other words, it is not obligated to change the rule in response to your objection. And you cannot object on the grounds of, well, there's a better option. I think you should try this approach instead of that approach. You only can object on those seven grounds, and once you object, the agency can, is not required to, modify the rule in response to your objection. If the, your objection from LCAR, let me just get through the last two points and then I'll, let me swing back to you, is that okay? Um, if LCAR's objection is not withdrawn after the agency responds, you can certify the objection and file it with the Secretary of State. And at that point, if the agency responds, it basically flips the burden of proof. So if there's a lawsuit concerning that rule, the burden of proof is now on the agency to demonstrate that it satisfied those seven potential grounds that you could object on. It does not invalidate the rule. They still can proceed with the rule. The rule still is binding and has the force of law. It just means that after subsequent litigation, the burden of proof is switched. Yes, sir. So when you say you could object, you're referring to Elkhart. the leg legislative committee. Yes, yes. Yeah. I am. Yes. With input from the chairs of the committees of jurisdiction. Yes, that's a very good point. Thank you. So um, I believe I read some Chestnut uh, Tangerines on Elkhart. I don't know if any of uh, the rest of you are. Or have been. Okay. So there is provisions in law, and I think it's also a matter, a matter of courtesy, that if there's a substantive rule that the agency of jurisdiction, uh, sorry, the committee of jurisdiction would be consulted and then an opportunity to weigh in. There's also an emergency rule procedure, I'm not gonna go into that, that basically allows an agency or department to do a rule more quickly, and um, that just speeds up the process, and they can have the emergency rule and simultaneously have begun the, begun the normal rulemaking process. So the takeaways are that rules have the force of law, they're binding, there's limits to what an agency can do in its rulemaking process, that the legislature is involved, but LCAR has a somewhat limited role, for example, <coughs> limited grounds to object, and even if they do object, the agency or department still could promulgate that rule. Is that clear to everybody? Any questions about that? Uh, so many. I know. <laughs> so, so many. I can't wait to get more to this. Do you want to ask them now or do you want to ask them later? No, I, think I, I, just, I would like to see where the information that you were reading. The so statutes? Yeah, yeah. Sure. what are the statutes? I would just, so that I could read them. Um, I give you a citation right Look, now. But I would ask it, it, There's it, a whole chapter on it. It would be helpful um, uh, if you know, your notes from taking us through this today, um, if you could supply us with those, because I'd love to go through some sure. of that yes. as well. So, and, just you know, 3 VSA 44, 845 starts, I can give you that chapter. There's a whole chapter. 3 VSA 45. It's 844, 845, <laughs> I think it starts. There's a whole chapter on it. And it would be great but, if you could sure. do that to Sarah. For yeah. Um, they're my personal notes, so as long as they're not posted. There's nothing mysterious or, you know, in yeah. there, but they're sort of ad hoc notes that I wrote up. I can't so. write as fast as you're talking. All right. right. <laughs> sure. Be glad to. So we could talk about rulemaking process now, or we can proceed to some of the legal and constitutional issues, and then I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you have. What do you prefer as far as I'd prefer keep to going? Go the next step sure. and kind of work through your outline. All right. So there's certain legal issues raised by this bill, and um, in no way does it mean you shouldn't or you can't take up and proceed with this bill. I'm merely highlighting legal issues that you should be aware of, because they might be raised in subsequent con conversation, or you might want to follow up on them and get other perspectives. Mm -hmm. So the first one has to do with separation of powers and the delegation doctrine. So I think you all of you are aware of the separation of powers, but just to base everyone on the same point, um, there's three branches in our government, the legislative, executive, and judicial. And to quote from a case from the Vermont Supreme Court, the legislative power is a power that formulates and enacts the laws. The executive power is a power that um, enforces the law. And the judicial power interprets and applies the laws. So there's some overlap is permissible between these three functions and these three branches. But it is unconstitutional for one branch to usurp and exercise a core function of another. For example, you cannot try and adjudicate a case. That's a responsibility of the judicial branch. The judicial branch 
can't develop and pass a law. That's your responsibility. So, tied to the separation of powers is the so-called delegation doctrine. And this doctrine uh, basically states that it is unconstitutional for the legislature, the lawmaking branch, to delegate its supreme legislative authority to another entity or branch. Now, it's been, I'm going to summarize, I'm not going to quote at length some uh, statements from various cases, but in essence it means that the legislative branch is supposed to formulate the state's policies through law that it enacts, and it may confer on other entities, for example, an agency or a department of the executive branch, the power to apply the general provisions of that law. <coughs> and to exercise its discretion in doing so. Can you now, let, me, let me keep going with two cases, and don't please focus on writing down what I'm saying, because I think once I get through these two cases and, and tie those threads together, it'll be clear. And I'll, I'll send you my notes, but there's nothing that I'm saying that you need to write down, I don't think. So there's two cases I want to go through uh, very, very briefly. One is called Waterbury versus Melendi. It's a case from 1938. And the other is a more recent case concerning the um, uh, Green Mountain Care Board. So in the Melendi case from 1938, basically a state law was held unconstitutional under the delegation doctrine. I think it may be the only time in Vermont that that's been done. But the crux of the issue was that the Public Service Commission was ordered and authorized to apportion the expenses of flood control among state agencies and municipalities. So there were costs incurred in flood control measures, and this uh, agency, the uh, Public Service Commission, had the power to apportion those costs to uh, towns and villages and uh, various municipalities. And the court held that the law was unconstitutional under the delegation doctrine because it did not provide any standards in making that determination, any guidance in how to apportion those funds. Now, more recently in a case called NRE MVP Health Insurance Company, which is a 2016 case from the Vermont Supreme Court, that was actually a challenge to a 8 PSA 4062, which empowers the Green Mountain Care Board to approve or deny health insurance rates. So it was a fairly recent law and was challenged on multiple grounds, including violation of the delegation doctrine. And under that statute, the board is empowered to determine <coughs> and approve a proposed rate. And it's supposed to look at whether that rate is affordable, promotes quality care, promotes access to health care, protects insurer solvency, and is not, quote, unjust, unfair, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to the laws of the state. That is a criteria set forth in that statute. That's a criteria that the Green Mountain Care Board is obligated to look at when determining whether they should approve or deny a proposed health uh, insurance rate increase. Now, the argument was that this statute was unconstitutional because it delegated the legislature's core function to the Green Mountain Care Board and did not provide sufficient guidance. The Vermont Supreme Court rejected that argument and held that the law was constitutional because the Green Mountain Care Board's discretion was curtailed by the considerations I just summarized of factors. And although these standards are, quote, general and open-ended, they have reflected the practical difficulties of establishing more detailed standards. So I believe that this bill may raise delegation concerns, but I do believe it is constitutional. In other words, I think it satisfies the MVP Health Insurance Company test. Because the, there is criteria set forth in this bill. Number one, it sets very clear numerical benchmarks based by year. And number two, it gives the factors that a and is supposed to weigh in developing its rules. And I ran through those for you earlier. And some of those criteria, some of those factors to look at are somewhat general, somewhat open-ended, but under MVP that is permissible because it's perhaps difficult to be more specific. So the takeaway, you may hear 
or it may be raised in other testimony that this law raises delegation doctrine concerns. I think that argument could be made, but I think there's very strong arguments on, on the other side that it is constitutional. Yes? This is probably a much more involved answer than you're able to give today, but do you see a, a key way to remedy the potential challenge with the delegation doctrine issue? Let me talk about separation of powers, and then we can get to that. Yes, I mean, in, in very short right now is if you're proceeding with this bill and you wish to pass out a committee, you could always, you can modify anything in the bill, right. but you could give more guidance if you wish. I, I think that there's an argument that the guidance already given is sufficient, but you could give more. You could be more specific. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about separation of powers, which I actually began with and is closely tied to the delegation doctrine. And this is the one time I take off my nonpartisan hat. So I began by stressing my nonpartisan role. Well, now I'm going to take that off a little bit. I'm going to be a little opinionated because I'm chief counsel of the General Assembly. I'm not chief counsel to ANR, not chief counsel to any executive branch agency. I'm your attorney. And so I want to run through some issues that I think this bill raises from that perspective. You've heard testimony from various witnesses that over 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont are transportation related, and over 20% are residential or commercial related, in other words, thermal efficiency, and that electricity is 10%. That's not my data, that's data that's been given to you numerous times. To meet the goal set forth in this bill, ANR is going to have to address transportation sector. We're going to have to address residential, commercial, thermal efficiency sectors. They may well have to address the electric sector also. So you're giving huge regulatory authority to the executive branch agencies and departments to regulate very broad swaths of Vermont's economy and society. It's going to be transportation, it's going to be thermal efficiency, it could be electric, it could be other things also. So the question is, your chief counsel, being somewhat opinionated, isn't this a core legislative function? Isn't this a core legislative function? You can hand it off to ANR. You can do that. That's constitutional. You can do that. But the question is, think of how you would do that and some of the issues it raises. So first of all, is if you hand it off to the executive branch, how do you know what you will get back from? So we went through the rulemaking authority. I'm sure that I undertake a very appropriate process and develop the rules and obey the law, but you don't control what they would come back with. I mean, similar to what's happening with TCI. They're negotiating the TCI agreement, which could have a major impact on transportation in the state. And the General Assembly is sort of backed off and is not exercising any oversight over that process. That is legitimate. You can certainly do that. But it means when they come back with the TCI agreement, it's a fait accompli. That ship has sailed. It may be a great agreement. You may love it, you may hate it, maybe somewhere in between, but it's done. And so you have less authority over the end result if you don't participate in the process. It's similar to this if you're giving ANR the obligation of regulating broad swaths of Vermont's economy and state, you don't have as much control over the end product as if you did that yourself. So obviously, you can't do everything in the weeds and all minutiae. But if you're setting the guidelines, if you're determining the policy, if you're making the decisions, you're more involved. I have a question. I'd like. yeah. Sure. So I'm, I'm going to be guilty of asking a question I think I know the answer to here. But to what extent can, uh, I, I think I know that we can pass a law that obligates future <coughs> um, executive branch officers, whether it be the governor or an agency, to fulfill that <coughs> obligation under a law. Um, so I can see why this bill was drafted mm -hmm. to say, here's what we're going to do, and we're going to sure. obligate ANR going forward to, sure. uh, and, you know, to, to actually and the uh, the AG, yep. although well, it's a may, not a shall, um, to uh, fulfill the obligations under this law. Yes. So the question that I have that I think I know the answer to is, to what extent can we pass a law that will obligate future legislatures? You can't. 
And just think about it, because you do this every year. When you pass a budget, you uh, you sort of say, you know, so we're uh, considering every other law. Right. So we're capable of doing that. Well, I mean, you, I guess every law obligates someone going forward, right? So every law you pass binds an executive branch agency or dictates individuals' behaviors going forward. But the next session, the legislature could unwind that. That's the doctrine of you can't bind the future legislature. Yeah. They can always change your mind and pass a law that changes or unwinds what you just did. So I don't want. But, but if they don't do that, it yeah. it, it continues in force. So I don't want to solve this problem yeah. right now. So we don't have time. But uh, a question I have is if we are um, if we are statutorily obligating the through this bill. Uh, the state of Vermont mm -hmm. uh, to put in place policies that will allow us to reach these yep. goals. Um, and we're pointing a finger at the executive branch to come up with the plan to do that and then to enforce it. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to, um, how we can obligate the legislature to follow the law um, um, in terms of playing a playing a part in that process. Well, let me get, I, I'm actually almost done. Um, okay, so but, uh, like I, but said, I think just, when I try to pull the threads together at the end with some issues for you to think about, yeah. um, that may become a little clearer. Yeah. So, um, one thing to keep in mind when you're putting a rule-making mandate, especially a very broad rule-making mandate on the agency or department, is they cannot appropriate funds. So they cannot appropriate funds. So if you're asking them to engage in activity that's going to cost money, potentially a lot of money, only you can appropriate funds. So be aware of that. Um, I want to talk about putting, now taking off my slightly opinionated hat and putting back on my uh, nonpartisan hat. I want to just wrap up by talking about potential issues that pertain to implementation. To be very clear, it doesn't mean you shouldn't pass this bill. You can't pass this bill. You can. It just means if you're proceeding with this bill, these are some of the things to think about. And these are some things you may want to hear testimony concerning. One is how does the new regulatory approach fit within the existing regulatory approach? Representative Yatashka, that was your question going back to the beginning of my presentation. There are programs, laws already on the books some of which pertain to greenhouse uh, gas reduction. Uh, there's requirements as to weatherization of existing buildings set forth in Title 10. There's um, pursuant to um, Title 30, Department of Public Service establishes uh, requirements as to uh, thermal efficiency for new construction, which they, they have adopted international standards. Um, there is the public utilities role in uh, issuing certificates of public good for electrical plants. And these are all things that have been talked about in this committee a lot. There's renewable energy standards under Title 30, which you've heard a lot of testimony about. Uh, Vermont's involved in REGI. Vermont may be entering TCI. a &R already regulates air pollution. There's an existing structure. Whether that works well or not, or works sufficiently or not, that's a policy call. But there's a lot already there. This bill doesn't wipe any of that away. It keeps it all. It doesn't change. And then it puts an obligation on a and in consultation with other agencies to develop rules to reach these benchmarks. That could create some cross-jurisdictions, could create some competition, could create some confusion. So it's something to consider if you're going forward, how does the new interact with the old? And who's responsible for what? <coughs> It's also an issue of resources and personnel, something that I can't give an opinion on, but if you're putting a substantial rulemaking authority or burden on an agency, can they do it? Can they do it in the time frame you've established of only 12 months? How should resources be reallocated? There's also an issue of what exactly are you asking a and to do? And this goes to what is the legislature's role. And I don't, these are just questions I'm throwing out. But if you think about it, you're setting very clear goals, very clear. They're mandatory. Um, you're giving some factors you're supposed to look at. But let's take as an example the transportation sector. As I said earlier, you heard testimony that's approximately 40 percent of greenhouse gas emissions in Vermont. So <clears throat> what are you asking NR to do? 
uh, RAP came back to you and talked about EV incentive programs. They gave you suggestions on potential programs that you could implement. Are you asking NR to make that decision? Are you asking them to develop incentives? Well, where's the, where the money coming from? Are you asking them to uh, ensure that there's sufficient infrastructure for charging? How are they supposed to do that? How are they supposed to pay for it? Um, if these things aren't working, whatever they try, what else are they supposed to do? In other words, these are the specifics of not only the goal, but what are the steps to get to the goal? And those are the kind of things you should think about. I certainly don't have answers to them. But you should think about either before you codify those steps yourself or you hand that authority off to an agency or department. Thank you very much for your patience. I'll be glad to take questions. So it would seem to me that uh, focusing specifically on a and &R may not be the best uh, approach, but to actually divide the uh, requirement among different, different uh, agencies or departments, uh, which, you know, we know DPS has electricity, and the Agency of Transportation has transportation, and uh, A&R has, I guess DPS also has heating, but um, A&R may be responsible for doing the measurements. Just a thought coming to my head. So um, we have some precedent for how we have addressed an issue um, environmentally in the mm -hmm. state with regard to water. Mm -hmm. Um, if we hadn't uh, been compelled by various parties as a state to deal with clean water issues that we were really coming up short on, um, we would not be dealing with clean water right now. Mm -hmm. I'm not that familiar with that issue area at all. Mm -hmm. um, but we are doing things in the legislature, we are doing the executive branch is doing things right now yeah. that they've been compelled to do. I would say we've probably gone more slowly than um, uh, folks doing that compelling would have hoped. Um, is there any analogy you can draw there um, as to the work that the legislative body and the General Assembly and the executive branch has done in the last <coughs> three or four years that draws a parallel? I, I think it's legitimate to draw some of the parallels. It's not my subject area, so I'd be reluctant to find. I, I think part of the push in water quality is the federal government. Yep. So that's well, not, whatever not the push so, is. That's so whatever the push is, the and I'll say the legislature sure. and the and the yeah. and the governor, yep. and the executive branch are moving forward on something that had they not been yep. compelled to. Yeah, it, it, that's a valid analogy, or and uh, certainly. Um, it's valid to also say that litigation or threat of litigation can push parties forward too. So, and, and I guess what I'm also thinking about is, um, you know, the legislature to some extent chickened out a couple of years ago and said, "Hey, uh, state treasurer, we'd like you to tell us, um, you know, give us a menu of options here that we then decided not to choose from, uh, and then tried to compel the governor to, you know, make some of the choices." Well, but there, the, the point is, I would say that that through some. Um, kludgy decision-making process, policy has proceeded yes. to move forward. I, I think that's a valid point. I oh, I'm not arguing one or yeah. the other. I'm just looking right. for an example no, of how I, to move I forward think it, on this. it's valid to draw that connection. What I'm conveying is to get to these goals, it would have to be a very broad-based approach. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what are the steps to get there? Who's mm -hmm. making those decisions, you or an agency or department? I would think that there would have to be a lot of steps taken that would impact a lot of everyday life to try to get there. Yeah. So water quality is a pretty big issue and very expensive, as you know. But if anything, comparison seems a little more constrained. Yeah. So. Go ahead, Mark. I have a question along a similar line, and that's under the enforcement piece. Yep. So I'm going to spout off here and tell me if I'm wrong or not, but why would there even need to be a section in there about any person aggrieved uh, uh, being able to file suit when it appears to me that that can happen now anyway? 
basically looking at the Massachusetts case where a group sued over wording in current legislation. So why why is that necessary if it can happen? So I'm going to try to find my answer to the legal question I think you had there. Um, so there's some differences between Vermont and Massachusetts. Uh, perhaps someone could sue in Vermont and have a similar result. I don't know. This strengthens that because it's the right of private action. So whether you think it's good policy or not, make no comment. But it does, it's there for the reason to ensure that a private party could bring such a suit. It's done in other areas of Vermont law, not, um, it's called QTAM proceeding in other areas. So it, it's not unique to this bill. It, it's phrased a little differently, but I don't think it's unique. Um, so to, to follow up on that, because this is one of the things, uh, obviously we are, we've heard over and over again, that we're not uh, meeting these goals. So this would put it into law. And I guess my question again is the, uh, is this um, possible litigation, so, uh, or, you know, the right to action, and it's against not only, it would be, people would have a right to action against the state for not meeting, is that correct? Oh, and or let me just, just an individual. Those. Let me just look at the language again. I, I believe you're right, but let me just, just double a, check. You know, a, I don't know, a trucking company or a, or a fuel company or something. <clears throat> so the AG can investigate and bring suit against a person. Any person aggrieved may bring an action. Yeah, I think both could bring suit against any person that was probably fined. So. And person what? Uh, broadly defined. It's broadly defined. So it could uh, be the state or a department yep. or a fuel company or a school or a, or you first. Or me personally. Yep. Yeah. Yes, I believe so. So, <laughs> so if, if there are rules in place, rules have the uh, um, authority of law. Yep. And so <clears throat> if there are rules in place and somebody were violating a rule, that will allow, even without this section, the ability of someone to bring a lawsuit against whoever was in violation of that rule, right? Uh, without this, that section? Yeah. I don't know. With that section, yes. Without it, I don't know. But I don't know. I'm not sure. Well, I can check on that, but I'm not sure. Okay. Specifically uh, well, but if, if somebody's breaking, breaking a rule, sure. I, I am not sure. I can check on that. Okay. So I don't know okay. if I... That's, that's a question I'm going to ask. I sure. want to make sure, Luke, that I understand the question that Representative Sherman was asking in your answer. So anyone can, make any anyone who is violating this can be sued, or anyone can bring the suit? Both. Person is defined broadly. So person is, I, I gave you the definition summarized for you. It's very broad. That is who can bring suit. And I think it could be against anyone violating the rules or failing to develop and enforce those rules for that matter. So it would have to be someone there, that has the authority to enforce those rules. No. So it's, so, a, private right so it's a private right of action. A person could be an individual, you or I or a municipality or a company or a corporation, legal entity of any kind could bring suit. Also, the way I read it, suit could be brought against any individual legal entity, municipality that's violating the rules. We have to be violating the rules. I don't know what the rules are. So in Massachusetts, it was the agency violating the law because they weren't developing the rules. That certainly seems appropriate in this language. Once the rules are developed, if someone is violating them, you could bring suit against them, but they have to be violating the rules. Hold on. Hold on. Does so, that make sense too? That yeah, I think so. Okay. Can I just walk sure. through what I think I'm hearing, which is that, so first we would have to develop the rules. So if there's no rules, then no one's getting sued. Well, the well, only one who's getting sued is the, is the entity responsible for not making the rules. The yes, that, we, that's what's happened in Massachusetts, okay. so perhaps that could happen here. Once we have yep. rules, yep. then we open the door to... But 
Is that what I meant? Well, again, uh, Luke, if I'm not mistaken, a private right of action can be brought if anybody believes somebody is breaking the rules. Well, I mean, listen, there's, the rules. there's like, a, well, just, that, just hold right? it, there's, there's a heck of a lot of lawyers in the world. Yeah. And there's a lot of lawsuits right. filed. Some are meritorious. I'm not being silly. Some are meritorious. Absolutely. Some are frivolous. That's what I'm, yeah. So I hear a lot. Oh, you could file suit. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't mean it's meritorious. It doesn't mean it'll go anywhere. Well, so no, just I understand to be clear, that, but a private yeah. right of action could be brought against an entity um, because somebody believes that they're not following the rules. Right. And then they and would have to go to court to and court establish and that. They right. indeed are violating yes. the rules. So right. there is a burden yeah. of proof that they would have to satisfy. That's right. Yes. Yeah. But that's no different than the any current, other suit. Right, right. I understand, but for this particular, yeah, sure. I just wanted to make sure we knew. So, if, I'm sorry that I missed everything leading up to this, but the, uh, so, so private right of action clearly designates that any, indivi any individual can act. Yes. Are, is it, is it fair to say that in most other lawsuits there, one has to establish whether one is a party? Yes, every lawsuit. So you, you have, have to establish standing. You have to establish party. Establish. Uh, you have to prove your case. Injury. But, if it's but a civil before case. that, you have yeah. to prove that you have standing. Yeah, these are all requirements. And this says you have, to have. This, this basically automatically says you have standing. No, whether, you still. It's frivolous no, or not. no, 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 no. You still have to prove that. Maybe it's easier to prove. Every case, you have to establish standing. Injury. If it's a civil case. I mean. You have to prove your case, so th that's no, it's no different here. So it's just saying that there's question. a broad so group of people who could bring a case. They would still have to prove that case, like any other lawsuit. So, what is the impact of having that language in there? It clearly establishes a private right of action, which I'm going to check if um, there would be such a private right of action without this language. I'm going to double check on that. I don't believe so. So what this means is an individual can sue to enforce the rules that A&R promulgates, right. or if an individual is violating requirements under those rules, can bring <coughs> suit against that entity. That's not always so under existing law without that language. It's a private right of action. So private citizen, organization, entity can, in essence, enforce the rules. That's what's different about the language. So I get yep. what this does. I'm not sure if the pre-existing or the current status without the language. I, I will check on that, but for argument's sake, let's assume not or less so. Okay. Hmm. What if B and C weren't part of this in the enforcement? Okay. Is there a legal question there? Yeah. I mean, that, that's a, so it would simply yeah. then be up to the Attorney General. Oh, so you still have the AG? But you don't have the, uh, well, I mean, yes, you could make that change if that's your question. Well, I know we can make that change. <laughs> uh, but, but essentially that right of a private citizen oh, is sure. under yeah. And I'll, right. I'll double check to see if there's, a, if there's an argument that without this language there exists a private right. I'll check. But for argument's sake, let's assume there's not. Then you take the language out. It's only up to OAG. Okay. So th this is about the uh, going back to the delegation issue. Mm -hmm. um, so if uh, I think I'm right, it, it, the more the more specific we are in statute in terms of what it is we're uh, asking the rule to do, yeah. uh, the more guide. In other words, the more guidance we get, the, the less likely probably that that, that would be um, legitimately raised. Uh, uh, but the flip side of that is that we could be, we the legislature, uh, citizen legislature could be wandering in way beyond our expertise mm -hmm. um, and in, into the weeds if we get uh, too specific. So I guess that's, to me, that's, that's, that's the balance that has to be. Uh, you don't want to just say, hey, go write some rules. Um, uh, you want to be fairly specific, but, but we, we don't have the expertise or the time uh, to be too specific, I guess. I think that's a legitimate point. Mm -hmm. You know, taking off my nonpartisan hat, putting on my opinionated hat, yep. I think the legislature might want to 
determine some of those steps to get to those benchmarks. Okay. Could you go back to, um, so it was number two on the rulemaking limits? Number, you, oh, when I was going through the yeah. LCAR process? And, and just read that again and maybe explain it um, sure. just a little bit more. It sounded interesting to me. So if this is going back, Representative Higley is referring when I said that there's limits to what can be done under rulemaking. Number one was provide for penalties, fines, not otherwise authorized under law. Number two, enlarge the authority of any agency unless otherwise, otherwise authorized. Or three, allow any agency by rule to require permits for licenses unless otherwise authorized. So number two was enlarge the authority of any agency. If you pass this law, you are enlarging the authority of ANR. So but we're doing that. Yes, yes, you're, you're, you're telling ANR that they need to exercise their authority to pass these rules that will be quite broad. So I, I don't think that's a problem. But, but wouldn't they also be requiring other agencies to enlarge their um, authority as well? Well, ANR seems to be the <coughs> primary rulemaking authority here. They're supposed to consult with transportation and others, and I assume they would, but they seem to be the ones that would be promulgating or taking the lead on promulgating. And this bill, uh, if it becomes law, it does confer on them that authority, so you're authorizing them to do that. Thank you. Yeah, I guess yes. I, I was thinking in terms of the degree of specificity that we get into here as far as, as far as the goals and steps to get there. Sure. And I was thinking of it in terms of of, uh, of code, because I, I'm involved with buildings and codes and stuff, codes and standards. And so I, I guess I'm thinking that what we're trying to get at here is more of a, in, in code language, a performance spec, not a prescriptive spec. In other words, we want a building to meet a certain, in the case of a building, we want a building to meet a certain uh, efficiency metric, you know, as opposed to saying we'll have R38 in the attic. So I'm saying, so I'm, I'm, what we're trying to do is, is find the balance between those two. Um, it, it seems like what, what we should be aiming for in law and statute is, is a performance spec. It's more, more like performance spec than a prescriptive spec because of the lack of flexibility that a prescriptive spec would, would have. Am I, am I, do you understand my analogy? Is that is that? I understand sense? your analogy. I don't. Your question. You know, well, so, uh, but I understand, I understand what you're saying. I just. Yeah. It's not something I would answer. Okay. So, well, does that make sense to you? I guess is, is my question. Your statement makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Councilman. <laughs> 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 He's hired. <laughs> Borrow that statement. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just going to elaborate. <laughs> we could give, we could expand the authority of ANR, but ANR can can expand its own authority. Or be trans. Well, so, well, or oh, yeah, be trans. Yeah, or be trans yeah. or somebody else. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, well, maybe, it's, maybe this isn't the time for the question, but uh, you know, we are giving a lot of. I just need a thought. We are giving a lot of authority to ANR. Um, and we have DPS and ADT in this bill. Yes, yeah. What did I say? Close. Ag. What, no, ag, no, ag actually is not in this bill, I don't believe, um, yet. And so, you know, I just wonder, I, I wonder but my question is, is that, is there, is there a place, and I don't think it's a question for Luke, that's a question for her. I don't even know if it's a question for Peter, uh, but I think it's a question we need to ask. Like, is there a point person? Um, well, and I think that's, a, that's, a, that's a, what was it? Like? Is there a point person in the administration on this? This is like a huge um, Act 46 statewide education plan. That's what this is. No, I actually think this is, <laughs> this is much bigger than that, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't say that with prejudice one way or the other. We have, we have a crisis related to uh, climate change. Um, our state unilaterally is not going to solve that issue, um, but we do need to be making steps that uh, move us down the path to being part of that solution. And the legislature and, frankly, the executive branch have demonstrated a, a lack of capacity, whether it be moral or political will, to address these issues. And what this law, this bill is is directed at and again this is a draft of a of a bill 
But what this bill is directed at is compelling the executive branch uh, to come up with mechanisms with which to fulfill these obligations. And, you know, I think a question that's definitely arisen here is uh, to the extent that legislators would have an interest and I would question capacity to participate in that process in an an, you know, on an annual basis. Um, and you know, to the extent some of that authority should or should not reside with the executive branch. Um, but absent, and you know, this is one idea, uh, a bill that was introduced and co-sponsored by a number of legislators. This is one idea as to how to approach this, that Massachusetts has gone down this path, other states have gone down this path as well, Connecticut. This, uh, Luke, I think as you introduced, is a bill that's based on Right, but has not in a, has not been <coughs> It was a 2018 bill and it stayed in committee. Yep. Yeah. And in Massachusetts, there was indeed the, uh, I think it was called the Global Solutions Act or something similar. Yeah. But there was also other bills passed, was one about, I think, green communities that actually in statute set forth a lot of requirements. Yeah. State requirement to buy cars, state requirement um, thermal efficiency, Reggie, implementation of Reggie. So in Massachusetts, there was certainly this regulatory approach. But there also was the uh, Massachusetts legislature put a lot in statute about what else to do. So. But you know, I'd also say thinking about this, what has um, arisen in my mind is that we lack a strategy, a coherent strategy as a state as to how to address this issue. And you know, again, we can argue. I don't think we can argue about whether we should, whether or not we should have a strategy as a state. Maybe we can. Um, that's a pretty easy answer for me. We don't have one. And, uh, you know, should the legislature be developing one? Should the executive branch be developing one? We need one. And um, I would say that this is, is trying to press us in a direction to, you got to have a strategy, and that strategy has got to be um, directed at meeting these goals. Mr. Chair. Yeah. So one of the things that... Uh, so I'm going to pay the check. Okay. The questions for me, right? We have one of your chairman on this, too. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> one of the things that I... It, you know, it, if we move this bill, that I want to make sure is a part of, at least a part of our discussions around climate change. They're very focused, I feel, on um, emissions only. And... I think it's really imperative that we think about um, making sure we're talking about protecting Vermonters right now from the impacts from the storms that we know are happening um, and that we ensure that those things are really connected, um, that we're not just talking about um, emissions, but we're also talking about protecting now, right now, life and um, resilience, whatever we want to call it. Um, I think we saw the climate change website that is up there, which I would, I, I, I know you, I know you love that, uh, that website, um, Deputy Secretary, but um, I think uh, something along those lines is really imperative where we are so that uh, Vermonters, legislators, the executive branch knows what is happening, what we're doing um, to combat what is happening, um, how folks can protect themselves, you know, and, uh, you know, these, these storms are happening right now. And, you know, we're racing, and I think rightfully so, to participate in emissions reductions are important, but if we, you know, go to zero emissions in Vermont, we haven't mitigated the threat to Vermonters, which is immediate. And so I think we cannot overlook that aspect. So the question is, should these be parallel efforts, or should these be one concerted effort in one bill, which could possibly become very <laughs> well, I would, um, well, if we were, if so, if the question is, is it one or the other or both, if we go to one or the other, I would go to infrastructure 
I would go to infrastructure because the threat is immediate. It's today. It's now. Right now. Impacting Vermonters in Vermont. And we can do some things about that today. So I would actually like to see us do both. But if we had to choose, I would choose infrastructure. I actually do have a question for you. Um, that right of individual action, um, if we're talking about storms and their effect in Vermont, would that allow somebody in Vermont to bring suit against somebody outside of Vermont for the effects of their actions here? Well, Tom, I had, I don't see it because it would be for violation of the rules promulgated by Vermont agency. Let me think about it, but I don't see it at first blush. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, I live there in Vermont violating Vermont rules, right. even right. their oh. Connecticut corporation, maybe, but if it's a polluter in Connecticut, it, I, I, I'd think about it, but I don't really see it at first blush. Okay. So. Thank you. you know, what I was going to say or about your point is that I agree exactly that we ought to be focused on the threats that, that we're going to face here, regardless of what we do about emissions. It's not in the future. <laughs> it's not in the future. It's, it's, it's now, and, we, and, 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 uh, and we can see the threats growing, and we, and we need to take steps um, towards addressing those threats. And I think those steps don't have to be, as I've said before, I think that those, those steps don't have to be looked at strictly as a cost to, to us, to, to society. But as an opportunity, if if we if we do it the right way, so how do we do that? Well, there's, there's all kinds of debates you know, to have about that. But um, we have to transition our economy so as not to be as vulnerable to the changes that are coming down the track. So that's the big big question, or the big picture. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry, but I need to leave. <laughs> Have a good weekend. Right? Maybe, you know, we'll get this figured out. Let me know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you on Tuesday morning. <laughs> okay. But look, so we're done here today. People want to talk more. I welcome it. But um, that, that's our last testimony for today. It's too clean with time, so I don't want to leave more. <laughs> you want immediate action? <laughs> immediate remedy? <laughs> Got it. Immediate <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> action? Some more, definitely. <laughs> well, what are we going to do with this? Uh, well, we're, we're, on, we're working on it. <laughs> <laughs> you ready to vote that? Almost. No changes. <laughs>